Well, thanks for having me. So I have a big task today. I have to, de to debunk 10 myths about AI in 10 minutes. So let's go. All right, so one of the big myths about AI is that everybody knows what bias means. Everyone has the same idea about what bias is. And I interviewed engineers at a massive tech company, and everyone gave a different answer about what bias is in AI. So some people said, and these were the engineers, as you can imagine, bias is actually a mathematical term. It's like the intercept from the y-axis. Other people said bias can be good, right, in terms of trying to find a threat. You can bias towards finding threats rather than being fair. Other people said, you actually can't remove bias at all. How do you know what's biased and what really is the signal that you want? So when some of us are thinking here today, what is bias in AI? You're not alone. Even the people that are making AI are thinking the same thing. Now, it's really, really important that everyone has the same idea about what we're trying to do when we do AI ethics and we think about bias. So I would recommend thinking in terms of harms. What are the possible harms for consumers? What is the possible kinds of discrimination that these systems can achieve? Right, so the second big myth is that only personal data can be biased. So we think that perhaps personal data means data that's about your race, your gender, ability, that kind of thing. But actually, a lot of data that's being used, for example, is Wikipedia data. And engineers often don't think that Wikipedia can be biased. After all, isn't it just a big encyclopedia online? So some people say that Wikipedia is neutral. But actually, 90% of Wikipedia editors are men. And women make up only 17.8% of biographies on the site. So we need to start thinking a little differently about what biased data is. Myth three. So we're all really familiar with these kinds of images of AI, the, the, hum the humanoid that's got this uh, you know, pose like this, le penseur, the thinker. Um, that's a, the archetypal pose of the intelligent male. And perhaps when we think of what AI creators look like, we'll think about ex machina. We've got Nathan Bateman on the left the kind of guy that makes AI all on his own in the basement. And actually, he only wants to make sex bots. We need different images of who creates AI, of what an AI creator looks like, and what kind of AI they create in their image. So we have here on the right really amazing images that were produced from a project called Better Images of AI. The furthest right image is of large language learning models, so like ChatGPT. They are text. Uh, they generate text. And this is exactly what they do. But this image isn't really computational. This is a kind of beautiful reality of what these systems actually do. And then further to the left, we have a silicon crystal. Sometimes we think that AI is immaterial. It's not made of anything. Or that the cloud isn't really built in data centers, that it's not massively energy consumptive, that it's not really harmful for the environment. So we need to have better images when thinking about what AI is and the impact that it has on our world. Myth four. I think we've all talked about the Terminator when we think about AI. And actually, when I was interviewing engineers, 100% of them that use science fiction analogies talked about films with humanoids with guns. Now, this militarization of AI is a problem because not all AI is like that, and we don't really want to build this. But if we keep talking about it, we'll build it. People said, I probably watched too much Terminator when I was a kid. Well, that's probably true. I've been working with the UK government's Office of AI to try and make AI and its capabilities more explicit in the way that they're communicated to the public. This means not hyping AI so that it all seems like the Terminator, but it also means communicating its limitations, what it can't achieve, as well as what it can. Myth five, AI can de-bias hiring. I looked into video hiring technologies from HireVue to my interview that try to de-bias hiring by only looking at a candidate's personality. 
and not looking at their race and gender. But is personality, race, and gender free? Well, the second year computer scientists at Cambridge, these brilliant students that I worked with, didn't think that that was true. They didn't want to have their race and gender stripped from them. They wanted recruitment managers to see them for who they were and appreciate them for everything that they stood for. So we recreated one of these video hiring tools. And actually, they showed that if you change the contrast, brightness, and saturation of your image, that also changes your personality score. So do these systems actually work? OK, so another thing we hear a lot is that raw data is possible, that data can be raw. When we think of raw, raw food, you think of something that's uncooked, natural, pure. But data is always harvested in a particular way. There's always choices that are made about how it's selected, how it's aggregated, how it's cleaned. There's that language of cleaning data that's used a lot. Those are all political choices. There's an amazing book called Data Feminism by Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein about how feminist methods can make the use of data better, which shows that feminist ideas can make a massive difference when it comes to something very specific and practical like data. OK, compulsory GPT slide. So another myth, that GPT is customer-facing ready. I think many of you know that that's probably not the case. If you think there are risks, then you're probably right. Even Sam Altman said, if it's still flawed, still limited, and it seems more impressive on first use than it does after you spend more time with it. So you have these kind of parlor tricks at the moment where people are making fun alarm clocks with different kind of generated poems on them. That's all great and good. But as Brett Carlin said, when AI can be a depressed, sad sack who pushes everyone away, then I'll be impressed. I've talked to lots of people who work in marketing, branding, law, about the use of GPT. Students at Cambridge are using it, apparently 45% to support their essays. If you're using it as something to prompt ideas, that's great. But again, if you're putting these things out there for customers to interact with, that comes with its risks. Myth number eight, AI can predict the future. Well, this is an issue because the UK government has now spent five million pounds on a technology called Data Miner that is a kind of predictive policing software that tracks and monitors protests and that claims that it can detect when a crowd of people is likely to turn violent. But how do you know which crowd will become a dangerous protest? Well, this technology was trained on Black Lives Matter protests in the States, and it's more likely to flag crowds of people with signs that say, justice for Freddie Gray, or hashtag BLM, or defund the police, as likely to turn into a violent protest. Which also, of course, shows us that AI is always political, especially when it's being used by specific kinds of politicized clients, like the police. And our final myth, that debiasing means improving. So there's a lot of debate at the moment about whether we should, in a kind of Sheryl Sandberg way, lean in and improve, and improve the technologies in technical ways. If there are technical solutions, why could we not just use them to improve, for example, the way that facial recognition detects black female faces? Now, two computer scientists called Timnit Gebru and Joy Bolamwini tried to do this. So they tried to create a more inclusive data set that was more representative of different kinds of faces. However, they were heavily criticized for using these kinds of scales like the Fitzpatrick type and Lucian scale that identify different kinds of skin tone. People have said that the fact that facial recognition doesn't recognize black people well is not the problem with them. And efforts to improve them by making them more efficient at recognizing black people really just increases the efficacy of a dragnet aimed at people that are already targeted by law enforcement for harassment, violence, and other harms. So what does it mean to improve AI? Who are we putting at risk? What kinds of methods do we want to use to make it less harmful and less discriminatory? The jury is still out, and those conversations are still being had. 
So we actually did that in eight minutes. <laughs> so thanks very much for listening.